Welcome to um, Kickoff Sunday. Welcome to the beginning, the kickoff of our sermon series for this fall. We're going to be looking at the book of Job. We're going to be addressing the problem of suffering, and we're going to, and just the unpredictable path that life uh, puts in front of us, and, and how we can find peace in the middle of it, how we can find stability, strength to walk that uh, with the God who's ever present and always with us. And so we're going to be addressing why, why, why bad things happen to good people. Did you know that your life is like a, a can of shaving cream? Yeah, there's a, there's a label on the back, right? And it says something like, warning, contents under pressure, don't throw into the fire. Okay, and this is true. This is true for all of us. This is true no, no matter who we are. Um, young or old or rich or poor or healthy or sick. It's true for all of us. We, we all are under certain pressure. We all have pressure um, around us and over us and, and un, that, we're, that we live under, that we live with. Um, peer pressure, for sure. Parenting pressure. Um, school pressure. If you're a um, student or teacher. Work pressure. Health pressure. Could be could be loneliness pressure, uh, grief pressure, <clears throat> trouble pressure. We're all under various kinds of pressures, and often, often we it's almost just like we're just trying to survive one day the next. We're just trying to survive the day. We're just trying to get through the day um, with what we've been given, and 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 we kind of in the back of my in the back of our mind we. We, we wouldn't even know what we would do if things got worse than they are, if one more thing got added, because like we're right at that pressure point, and we don't even know what we would do if things got worse. But we live in a broken world, and so we can expect, we can expect things in our life like that can. We can expect things in our life at any point to explode. And when things in our life explode, what are they going to do? They're going to push us off the path that we're on. And when at any point things can explode, that means the path we're walking on is a pretty unpredictable path. So what happens? We often get hit with, we often get hit with bad news. And the thing about getting hit with bad news, there's, there's nothing we could have done about it. There's nothing we could have done to avoid it. There's nothing we could have done to stop it. We just get hit with bad news. It might be a cancer diagnosis. It could be the loss of a job the unfaithfulness of a spouse, a pandemic, uh, a market crash, the death of a loved one. And that bad news is, is hard enough to take. But what about when bad news like that happens to good people? What, what, what about when bad news like that affects good people? Like it did this summer. A pastor in our church body, his name is Pastor Steve Whitty, who's serving as a missionary in Thailand. And he was home on furlough. He was home. He was vacationing with his family, well-deserved, well-earned vacation with his family up in northern Wisconsin. They were staying in a vacation rental, just enjoying some rest and relaxation with family. The whole family extended, was there. But on the night of July 1st, this summer, there was a fire that burned down the entire home they were sleeping in. Six people lost their lives. Pastor Steve Whitty, two of his three daughters, and three of his granddaughters. Pastor Steve and his daughter Lydia, they lost their lives by going back in to try to rescue others. Unspeakable tragedy. What do you even do with that? The, the, this nightmare could, could hardly have been worse. And yet it was. It was for, it was for daughter Hannah, the, the one surviving daughter, not only did she lose her father and her two sisters, but she lost her two daughters. 
when only the summer before she and her husband also lost their son in a tragic accident. And these are these are good people, <laughs> pastors, teachers, missionaries. <laughs> Why? They're good people, but something something bad happened to them. And when something bad happens to people like this, people tend to ask God, why? Why? It's an important question. And that question is the reason that many people choose not to believe in God. Right? If this God of yours is so good, they ask, then, then why does he let such bad things happen to, to good people, to innocent victims? even little children. And the fact that God does surprises them. But it shouldn't. The book of Job is, is proof that, that our God has a history of, of letting the worst possible pain hit the best possible people. Because the Bible describes Job pretty clearly as a good man who experienced the worst kind of pain. But also the book of Job, probably more than any other in the Bible, tells us why. And it does help us understand what God is doing when, when the bad news that you can't avoid changes the good plans that you had for your life. So first point we just want to throw up there right away today is, is this. Avoid simple explanations. There's not going to be any simple answers when, when we throw this question up there. There's never just some simple explanation as to why something happened. Um, there's no pat answer. There's no simple explanation. We're going to be thinking about that all the way through as we get now into the story of Job. So let's, let's dive into the book of Job and hear the story, see um, how this was carried out. Job 1. In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters, and he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. His sons used to hold feasts in their homes on their birthdays, and they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When a period of feasting had run its course, Job would make arrangements for them to be purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. One day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. And then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. So Job was blameless and upright. Now, that doesn't mean that he was perfect. doesn't mean that he never sinned. The, the Hebrew word there means that he was, it means whole. It means complete. So it means that his life was whole. His, his faith and his life were whole. His faith and his life were the same thing. They were, the, they were together, one piece, the same thing. So on the other hand, here's, here's, sometimes Christians can be, we can be phony, right? Christians can be phony, maybe. So uh, they can be regular at church, but dishonest in business. Or they can be very generous with their friends, but selfish in their marriage, right? So maybe we call it hypocritical sometimes. Like um, Christians can be hypocritical. They can be phony. They can actually live kind of Two different lives, like one thing around their Christian friends, another thing around their non-Christian friends, um, but not Job. He didn't just show up for church on Sundays. He lived his faith all week long in his marriage, in his family, in his business interactions. He was whole. He was complete. His faith in life was complete. It was one piece. And so Job lived his faith in everything he did. And he showed that by doing two things. He feared God and he shunned evil. So he feared God and shunned evil. So he, he actively was 
work, he was actively trying to get closer and closer to God. He was actively getting closer and closer to God in his word and in his promises, while at the same time running away from anything that God didn't want or didn't like. So he was living his faith. He lived a life of faith by faith, by that faith he had in God. And so God saw him as blameless and upright through that faith that he had in God. And that's what a good life is, a life of faith in God. The only thing you need is God. See, God believes that you don't need um, possessions, money, property, comfort, good health, strong muscles, healthy skin, even healthy children. And the proof that God doesn't consider those things necessary for good life is that he gave Satan permission to take them all away. We continue the story. Does, God, does Job fear God for nothing, Satan replied? Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But now, stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well then, everything he has is in your power, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. So then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby and the Sabaeans attacked and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword and I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The fire of God fell from the heavens and burned up the sheep and the servants, and I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword, and I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them, and they are dead. And I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. At this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. And then he fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. <coughs> so Satan had asked God, does Job fear God for nothing? Does Job fear you for nothing? Meaning, of course he hasn't. Satan is implying, no, he doesn't fear you for nothing. Satan is saying, he doesn't serve you for nothing. He doesn't love you, Lord. He loves the things he's getting from you. He doesn't love you. He loves the things. He loves the wealth. He loves the money. He loves the health. He loves the status. He doesn't love you. He loves the things. So if any of those things go away, He's going to curse you to your face. He's going to leave you. By the way, uh, this is true of all of us probably at times, right? We, we sometimes, we love people, love people, or serve them or because of what we're going to get from them, right? We're, we, sometimes we're motivated by what we're going to get out of it. If we're going to be kind to someone, if we're going to do something for someone, we too often are motivated by what we do, by what we're going to get out of it from them. And worse yet, we do the same thing with God. We often will we'll honor God, we'll, we'll follow God, we'll do God what God wants us to do as long as he's going to continue doing for us what we want him to do for us. So uh, what Satan is accusing Job of is something that we do struggle with. But not Job, not here anyway. In all this 
He didn't curse God. He didn't blame God. He didn't leave God. He loved God. Even while he was suffering, even while all this was taken away from him, which is the one time we really learned to love God for nothing, just for himself. And by the way, we're not even going to read all, but this wasn't the end of it. In chapter 2, um, with God's permission, Satan comes back and he attacks again. And this time he takes away Job's health. And he, and he just he inflicts him from head to toe with painful, painful sores. So painful they were that, that Job resorted to using broken pieces of pottery to like scrape his skin just, just to try to numb the pain. So Satan struck very painfully. But listen, Satan's main goal was not to have Job lose his, his home or his, his health or his wealth or his children. But Satan's main goal, as Satan himself said, his main goal was that, was that Job would curse God to his face. Satan's main goal, his only goal, was to get rid of the one thing that God calls good in our lives. Our faith. He was trying to take away Job's faith the one thing that's good, the one thing we can't live without. And you know what? That, that's Satan's only goal with you, too. That's Satan's only goal with you and me. By the way, just, just for fun, um, you want Satan to leave you alone? You want Satan to leave you alone? That's easy. Stop being good. Stop being good. Stop living your faith. Start caring more about your possessions and your property and your money and your wealth and your comfort and your stuff and your, your family and your children and your relationships and all the other earthly things. Start, start thinking about those more than your relationship with God. Start caring more about being right about stuff. Start caring more about being right about something than you care about being a, a loving, patient, sacrificial child of God. Start caring more about your own comfort than about the burden that someone else bears. Because then Satan's going to look at your life and he's going to say, ah, I don't need to take anything away. They already don't care about their faith. But if you do care about your faith, if you do care about your relationship with God, remember that Satan's work against Job isn't the exception. Jesus called him the prince of the world. <laughs> the prince of the world, as Jesus calls him. He does have some measure of control over the things that have such a strong hold on our hearts and lives, a strong hold on our thoughts and emotions, um, material things, health, wealth. Yeah, he can affect some of those things. I mean, can Satan bring diseases and pandemics into the world? Certainly. Certainly. Can he bring violence, wars, and crime? Yeah. Can he bring greed and fear and financial problems? Oh, yeah. Can he bring accidents, tragedies, mayhem? Yep. He is busy. But one thing we learn is that the only reason Satan is able to do bad things to good people like Job is because your God lets him. Who was the one that suggested that Job go through all of this? Who, who brought Job into the conversation? Who's the one who said, have you considered my servant Job? Who did that? God. It was God twice. God was responsible for allowing all this bad pain into good Job's life. Why? Why was God doing this? Why do bad things happen to good people? I've heard a lot of people say, and I probably, I'm sure I've said it myself, um, I could just, I could handle this suffering. I can handle this suffering I'm going through if God would just show me why I'm going through it. If God would just tell me exactly what he's doing here, why I'm going through this, then I'd be, I'd know why, and then I could handle it. It'd be easier. But then think about it. Because then, if, if that's our attitude, then you'd be serving God for, for, what, for what he's eventually going to give you. 
You'd be serving God for eventually for what you're going to get out of it. And the thing is that God wants you to serve him just to serve him. Just himself for nothing, not for what you get out of it. And the only way to make sure that you're serving God for himself alone and not what you get out of it is when you're serving him while getting nothing, even suffering. And, and friends, that's the reason that you can't always have the reason for why you're suffering. Because if you did, then you wouldn't become the kind of person that suffering can make you into. You'd never become the person, the kind of person that suffering can make you into. So our second point, I guess, in general is just uh, be okay <laughs> without having all the answers. Sometimes we have to be okay without having all the answers. Sometimes we just won't know. Sometimes we won't know. There's a reason we won't always know it. And yet, and yet, the Bible does give us the reason why God did this to Job. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, illust here's, I'm gonna illustrate it this way. I know it's a big secret to many of you, but the NFL kicks off this week. Football kicks off today. So we're thinking about football. So in the context of football, well, the last time I played tackle football would have been in high school. And now one thing, one thing I remember, um, I was like third string running back. Didn't play, I, I kicked, but I didn't play a lot of running. Anyway, what I remember is our first string running back. He was so good. And he, he was so good that actually he got the ball on almost every play. Um, and like, and he would have to pound that ball through those linemen. And I, what I just remembered, I remembered riding on the bus home and just seeing how beaten and bruised and battered and bloody he was after every game because he had the ball almost every time. And he had to pound it through these big defensive linemen who were like 180, 190, maybe 200. Now, I was the third string running back, meaning I never got the ball. Um, in, the, in, the, in those situations. And if I would have tried running the ball through 180 or 200-pound linemen, I would have been, been absolutely destroyed. Okay, got that picture in mind? Now, imagine me then playing in the NFL. Imagine me trying to run the ball through linemen who would be like three, over 300 pounds and twice as fast as I am. I would be more than destroyed. I don't think I would survive. I would be punished most severely. That would be the definition of agony. Agony. So, if you were the coach of an NFL team and you wanted to win, who would you put in the game? Would you put in the NFL rushing leader, Christian McCaffrey? Or would you put in me? Well, I think if you wanted to win, you'd put in CMC. And by choosing him, you would be sending the message that you wanted to win. And now, if you're Christian McCaffrey, would you consider that choice a honor or punishment? Now, during the course of the game, if he's getting the ball all the time, he's going to get, he's going to take some punishment. He's going to get hit. He's going to feel some pain and some agony. But I'm guessing if you're him, it would be an honor to feel that agony. And so sometimes there's agony that we go through, but it's an honor to go through it. There's agony we have to go through, but there's honor to go through it. especially if we want to win. Then how should we look at the agony that God chose for Job? The same way that we should look at the pain that God allows for you and me. The same way that you should look at the pain of, of losing your health, your job, your money, your control, your loved ones, your children. The same way you should look at the challenges that we maybe go through as a congregation or the challenges you go through as a family or the challenges you go through in life. The, the pain in your life, the agony in your life, the struggles and suffering in your life is God honoring you by choosing you to help him win. 
because he's using you to send Satan a message. And it's the same message that he sent Satan with an empty grave on Easter morning. You see, centuries after Job, centuries after Job, Satan assaulted another innocent sufferer who died naked and died while he was crying out, why? Why, God? Why have you forsaken me? And he never got an answer. His name was Jesus, and he was the son of God. And Job, Job may have suffered those seen as innocent, but Jesus truly was innocent. And Job may have felt abandoned by God, but he, he wasn't. But Jesus truly was abandoned by God. Jesus truly served God for nothing. And why did he do it? For us. So God sent a message to Satan on Easter morning after our best possible man went through the worst possible pain. And the message is this, that no matter how much, Satan, that no matter how much you take from him, no matter how much blood you shed of his, no matter how many nails you pound in, you cannot take away the one thing, that one thing he wants. You can't take away the one thing he wants more than anything. You can't take away the one and only thing he needed to consider his life good, even while he was hanging on a cross and dying. And what was that one thing that Satan couldn't take away from him? You. You, his children. Because he did that for you. To make everything good between you and God. He did that to forgive you. To forgive you of all of your sins. To forgive you even for the times that, that you have let your pain be an excuse for you to walk away from God. He did that for you and me. And now we're forgiven because of what he did. And, and now that we're forgiven of all those sins, even if you had been the worst kind of person, the worst possible kind of person right up to the moment where Jesus forgave you, even Satan himself could not take could not keep your life from the best possible ending, the one, the one where there's no more death or crying or pain, the one where every, every tear is finally wiped away. So friends, look forward to the ultimate solution. As we're going through suffering here, whether we know the reason for it or not, look forward to the ultimate solution. Why did he do this? Why did Jesus do this for us? He did this for us, okay? And that's your proof. This is your proof. You out there who are suffering and you have no idea why, it isn't because of anything you did, and it isn't because God isn't good. Mm -mm. When he died on the cross, God proved that Satan is a liar because Satan had said that God isn't good. God was so good that he became a human, and he gave his life for us. He died for us just to love us for who we were not because of what anything that he would get out of it. And did you notice something here in all this? Do you notice that, that God only allows Satan to accomplish the very opposite of what he is trying to accomplish? Always. Satan only accomplished the opposite of what he was trying to accomplish with Job. He only accomplished the opposite of what he was trying to accomplish with Jesus. And he only accomplished the opposite of what he was trying to accomplish with us. Satan only accomplishes the opposite of what he wants to accomplish. God only allows Satan to bring evil into our lives in such a way and in such an amount that it actually defeats Satan's real intention. Satan is only allowed by God to actually defeat himself and to achieve the opposite of what he wanted. Think about it. When, when, God, when God allowed what God allowed him to do with his son on the cross. 
that didn't separate you and me from God and cause us to suffer forever and eternally. <laughs> it did the opposite. That actually, what, what God allowed Satan to do with his son on that cross, actually removed the thing that separated us from God forever so that we wouldn't suffer forever. And so you're forgiven. You and I were forgiven of all of our sins, and God sees you as blameless and upright. In other words, um, your relationship with God, friends, is good. And so when God looks at you, he, lo- he sees the same thing that he saw when he looked at Job, and he said, have you considered my servant Job? He saw Job as his servant. God knew that that Job was someone who served his purpose by sending Satan the very same message that Jesus himself did. And so, friends, if, if, if your life of faith has any kind of discomfort or suffering or agony or pain in it, I want you to picture your God saying to Satan, hey, have you considered my servant and then fill in your own name. Have you considered my servant John? Have you considered my servant David? Have you considered my servant Mary? Fill in your own name there. Because God sees you as his servant. He calls you his servant. And is there any greater title that God could give us as he looks down on us from heaven? And that's why, that's why, After Job lost everything and all of that, he responded by saying, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. So friends, we're going to need something to lean on in this unpredictable path. We're going to need the word of God every step of the way. Every step of the way. So, you have a little homework assignment in your, if you got one of those service folders, um, it's read one chapter of Job. So one through seven this week, read a chapter of Job every day. Get into the word. So as you're reading through those chapters of Job, as you're reading God's word and stepping there and relying on it, as, you, as you're reading God's word and, and seeing there that you're never alone in your pain, and as you're reading God's word and seeing that that you never need to be afraid. As you're getting that peace from God who's always there with you, as he reminds you in his word, friends, praise the Lord, the God of grace, for giving us the right to see ourselves the same way that God does as his servant, chosen by God to walk the most unpredictable paths carrying out his most important purpose. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for considering us your servants. And we know that as we follow you, the path is is not only unpredictable, it's sometimes very painful and sometimes very difficult. Sometimes it's unimaginably difficult. Give us what we need in your promises and your word. Give us what we need to take step by step I ask you to be, especially with everyone in here who's, who's suffering and going through difficulties, lift them up. Give them the strength and stability along that difficult path. Hold their hand and help them through. And help us be a community of people who help each other through those hard times. That we can share strength, hold hands, and do this together with your help. We pray this in Jesus' name.